God, on the day we celebrate our nation's birth, we place our faith in you. You are the one who gives us freedom. You have endowed us with inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And may we pursue you with the passion that you first pursued us. As we celebrate our great nation, we remember the sacrifice and turmoil that this country was born out of and that continues to shape us today. We know that you are not done here. We know that we are far from perfect and we know that you have a plan. We pause to remember that you are our God and we are the people of your pasture. Help our country turn toward you. Bring revival to this nation. Give our leaders clear vision and sober minds. Bring peace and justice to our schools and unite us all as brothers and sisters. God, we ask that your kingdom would come and come quickly. May peace and prosperity come to your children living in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Amen. All right. Good morning, Discovery Fellowship Church. It is so good to see you again and be with you. And good morning to those watching live online. This is our first ever official fully live stream. Um, so you all are a part of history that are here in person this morning. And those of you watching at home, I apologize right now in advance for everything. Um, <laughs> those of you that are here right now uh, following along, I know our screen is really hard to see because the sun is currently right on it. In about 20 minutes, it'll be that much better. Um, so if you have the Bible app, the YouVersion Bible app on your phone, we have all of our lyrics, all of our slides. We have everything loaded on there for you. That might be a little easier to see than this one. If not, it's there as well. We also have lyrics printed and on each end right there. If you guys will stand, um, Pastor Bruce is going to pray for us as we begin our worship service this morning. Thanks again for being here. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have again to come before you with uh, praise and worship, Lord, as we sing today. Lord, we ask that uh, you just be a part of everything that we do. Lord, we want you uh, to be magnified and glorified this morning with the words we say and our actions, everything we do. Lord, thank you for this opportunity again to live stream to our congregation uh, that's uh, out and about around all the different places in Fort Collins and, and uh, Loveland and Greeley, everywhere that people are watching us this morning. Lord, we Ask your blessing on them. Father, be with us as we start this service and as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Glad you guys are here. I was very beneath my shame and so could carry that of weight, it was not true, till I met her. Come on. So the weary and the tired this morning. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was not true till I met you. Come on. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness to your glorious day. Your glorious day. I did not my 
so Now your freedom is all I know The only man Jesus, when I'm near to you You call my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness To your glory spirit You called my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness To your glory spirit Our stories, this is the gospel. I need you rest, my soul is heavy. Your chains break, I will lay the floor. I need a shelter, I was in love. Now you call me citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now you love the heaven I'm when you call my name, I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, to your glory's day. You call my name, I ran out of that grave. Jesus, we, we praise you for who you are in spite of our circumstances. We love you and you are worthy of worship, even when our hearts are tired. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope and without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt so praise you praise the father praise the son praise the spirit
held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church Oh God, how I need 
Amen. Have a seat. Thank you for singing. Awesome. Well, folks, if you're in any way associated with our children's ministries here at Discovery Fellowship, I just want to remind you, you probably received an email this week that uh, we're going to be having a children's program this morning. And so you can follow Pastor Matt and our children's ministries director, Marla Dervais, as uh, they lead the kids over uh, to the North 40 over there. They've got a set up and they're going to have a program for the children. If you'd like your children to attend that, they're certainly welcome to. Should be a lot of fun for them. Probably a lot more fun than them sitting here listening to me. But again, this morning, I want to welcome each one of you. Good morning to you. Uh, if it's your first time joining us here, in person. A very special welcome to you. In point of fact, as uh, Pastor Matt mentioned, this uh, service is being recorded and it is being broadcast at the very same time via the internet as we meet here. And so welcome to those of you who are tuning in at home in real time this morning as well. Uh, and if it's your first time tuning in online, a very special welcome to you. I trust that no matter where you are, um, that you had a, a wonderful and a safe Independence Day yesterday, and we're glad you've joined us for uh, worship on uh, this, this morning on this holiday weekend. So would you pray with me as we prepare to take a look at God's Word this morning? Father, thank you for another beautiful day. You have blessed us and favored us with good weather each time that we've met outside thus far, and we're grateful for that. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for the fresh air. Thank you for the shade. Thank you for the time that we can gather together as God's people and just uh, lift up our praises to you, acknowledging who you are and, and then submitting ourselves, our thinking, our convictions to the word of God. We pray, Father, that you would proceed the study of your word uh, by your Holy Spirit. Help us be prepared to receive that into some really good and fertile soil this morning, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, before we dive into the scripture, and seek to understand a little bit of what, what uh, God has to say to us today, um, I guess I would just like to offer you, if I could, a completely biased personal opinion. Um, I know that you didn't come here to hear my opinions, but since I've got the microphone, I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Um, you may not agree with it, and that is certainly fine. This is uh, the United States of America, and you are certainly free to disagree with me and uh, you have a perfect right to be wrong if you want to. That's up to you. But before I share it, um, let me just mention that last week, if you were here or if you uh, tuned into our worship services online, uh, then perhaps you recall that one of our elders, Jim Wickelman, um, shared the word of God with us. And I thought that he did an excellent job with that. If you did not catch that sermon, uh, I would encourage you to, and you can access it from our website if you care to. And one of the points that he made in that sermon was that oftentimes in our country, we celebrate holidays, but we don't necessarily always truly understand the meaning or the importance of what those holidays are all about. And so in the spirit of what Jim had shared, I would like to offer an opinion with respect to and in regards to the 4th of July or what we commonly call Independence Day. Uh, now, I... I am not intending to be pandering this morning, but I would just like to say that I personally believe that the United States of America uh, is the greatest country on the face of the earth today. Now, as I said, that is my biased opinion, but I base that opinion on a great many things, like the fact that we have the greatest form of national governance in the world. We have the greatest abundance of natural resources in the world. We have the greatest economy and economic system of free enterprise in the world. We have the greatest military and defense technology in the world. We have the greatest individual freedom under law for citizens of our country, just to name a few of the great things. Now, we are not a perfect country, certainly, far from it. But nevertheless, I still believe that we are the greatest nation in the world today. 
And so, in the spirit of the greatness of America, and in homage to this being Independence Day weekend, I would like to hearken you back to the foundations of our nation as we begin this morning and sort of juxtapose that with the Word of God. There are few things more foundational or more iconic to our nation than the Declaration of Independence. It is a document that was unanimously ratified by all 56 delegates to the uh, Second Continental Congress on July 4th. 1776 in Philadelphia, PA. And so we celebrate that historic um, milestone with a national holiday. And so this morning, I'd like to remind you of some of the opening words of that declaration. Some of you, no doubt, have probably gotten them memorized, but they are no doubt familiar to all of us. The preamble of the declaration begins with these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable, meaning cannot be taken away, rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In fact, in the first two sentences of the Declaration, there is a reference to the laws of nature, which are derived from nature's God, and also a reference to the Creator God. Our nation was founded upon the recognition that all that we have, in fact, all that is, is derived from a supreme being that originated and who even presently controls the universe. In addition to that, uh, the Continental uh, the Constitution of the United States, established on March 4th, 1787, by the Continental Congress. And the First Amendment to that Constitution explicitly says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right to peaceably, people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. As citizens of our country, you and I have certain guaranteed freedoms, five of them listed in that First Amendment alone. The freedom of religion, the freedom of speech, the freedom of the press, the freedom to petition the government, and the freedom to peacefully assemble. Now, those are great freedoms. They are not unlimited, but they are guaranteed by law unto, unto the citizens of this country. And so, my question for you this morning is, how will you use your freedoms? That is a question that I think has become a bit of a front burner issue in our society today, with all of the social unrest that we see going on all over the news media. We see stories and, and depictions of people exercising their constitutionally guaranteed liberties on Facebook and social media platforms. We see people expressing their right to free speech and often freely offering their opinions and in some cases sharing their ignorance and airing their biases or expressing publicly their outrage. Jennifer and I, in fact, have a relative in our extended family who absolutely hates our president. She despises Christians. She hates the police. She posts regularly inflammatory, vulgar, hate-filled rants nearly every day on Facebook. And she vehemently hates anyone who disagrees with her, family or not. Now, in my opinion, all that venting garbage does is divide and polarize and offend. But she feels and she has the freedom to do that. And of course, with the advent of COVID-19, this pandemic, the government at every level, from the White House, you know, down to the state house, to the county and city levels, government has stepped in to provide guidance and in some cases, mandated restrictions or limitations to yours and my freedoms. 
whether that be restricting how you and I can gather together or how we can conduct business or denying uh, the prospect of being able to worship indoors or requiring health screenings and temperature checks before entering buildings or even mandating the wearing of, of face masks or face coverings in public places. Our freedoms and our liberties are being spotlighted in an unprecedented way and in some cases restricted like never before in, in our lifetimes anyway. And so in light of all of that, the question I'd like to ask this morning as we've gathered here in person or at home to worship is how are God's people supposed to respond to all of this? Now, notice I did not say how do you feel about it? The question is, how must God's people respond? Or more fundamentally, what does God want us to do? Or if we drill down a little bit deeper or more personally, then the question would be, what is your objective for living in these very difficult, uncertain, unstable days in which we live. And even then, I realize that that can be a pretty sort of broad-based question. Because you might say, as you think about this, well, I've got some pretty straightforward objectives for my living. Like I'm just trying to stay safe, stay healthy, mind my own business. Or my objective is I, I work for a living to provide for myself, my family, that's imperative. That's really my main or my key thing. Or if you're a student this morning, maybe your main thing or your objective is to study in order to, to get an education, to provide a foundation for your future career. Or perhaps to hearken back to the Declaration of Independence, perhaps your main objective is to, to maximize your best life exercise your personal liberty, pursue your best happiness. That's guaranteed in writing after all. But when it comes to living and interacting and relating in this world in which you and I live, what is your objective when it comes to relating to other people? We are social beings after all, even though we've had to keep a little bit more distance lately, but all of us know different kinds of people, lots of different kinds of people who we are uh, regularly involved with. We work with them. We live with them. We recreate with them. We worship with them. We study with them. We have neighborhood get-togethers, even now, so, you know, socially distanced, of course. We connect with them as friends on Facebook or various social media. We engage with folks in the grocery stores, at Walmart, at coffee shops, all kinds of relationships that all of us have. So in light of that, what are you out to communicate and to accomplish in the way that you relate to other people in your world? And if you are inclined this morning to ask, is that really so important? I would say to you, that the more you read the scriptures, the more you come to realize that that is incredibly important. In fact, it is one of the most important things in God's mind about the way that you and I conduct our living. And so, therefore, it is important that you and I have clarity about the way that we engage and the way we interact and the way that we relate to other people. Scripture, I think, would say that we as Christ followers really only have three potential impacts upon people in terms of the way that we live and the way that we conduct ourselves socially. According to the way that we live and relate and interact, we either drive and we are encouraging people towards God and to deepen in their knowledge of and relationship with Him, or secondly, the way that we live and interact does nothing to move people towards God. 
Or else thirdly, the way that we live and relate and interact drives people away from God. What sort of an impact do you think that you are having on the people around you and the way that you relate to them? Are you drawing them towards the Lord, a desire to know God and to know Jesus Christ and to to deepen in their spiritual lives? Or by the way that you live, by the way that you interact socially, in person, on Facebook, whatever, or even by the way that you fail to interact? Are you doing nothing to draw people towards Jesus Christ or perhaps even driving them away. It seems to me that the Word of God gives us some pretty clear guidance when it comes to how you and I should be relating to the, to the society and to the culture around us and towards those that God has sovereignly put us in relationship with. So this morning, I'd like to offer you four key principles for our living, for our life, for our liberties, and for our pursuits. Now, it's taken me a little while to get here this morning, but let me offer them to you because um, it is actually critical, I think, that we understand these and that we bring ourselves and our living into conformity to them. First of all, as a Christ follower, someone who loves God, someone who wants to live their life in obedience to Him, that person obeys their government. Like it or not, this is clear revelation from God. As I said at the very beginning of this message, in our country, I believe that we have the very best form of governance. Again, it's not a perfect government. It does not have perfect leaders. The government is not always right, and it does not always act in our best interests, nor necessarily do the things that we would like or prefer. Nevertheless, Scripture, which is our ultimate guide for faith and practice, says in passages like Romans chapter 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority, is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will suffer the consequences. Likewise, in 1 Peter chapter 2, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to uh, to, to punish those who do wrong and to commend those that do right. This means that if the government says that you must pay your taxes, then you must pay your taxes, like it or not. If the government says, this is the speed limit, then you and I are obligated legally to drive the speed limit, whether you like it or not. If the government says, you must wear a face mask in this or that location or this or that circumstance, then that's what you have to do, like it or not. In point of fact, right now, the government is not mandating that you and I must wear a face covering when we are outdoors at a worship service such as this one, so long as we are safely distanced from one another. If you are not safely distanced, then the government says, wear a mask. It's that simple. A Christ follower is one who sets an example for others and demonstrates their love for God by being obedient to the government that God has established. The principle basically is this. So long as the government does not forbid us from doing what is right, or compels us to do something that is wrong and contrary to God's word, we submit ourselves to the government in obedience to God. Here's the second principle that should govern our social interactions and that should inform our objective for living. 
And that is very simply number two, esteem others above yourself. Now, I realize that is a bit counterculture and counterintuitive for a, a me first, take care of number one sort of a culture like ours. But Philippians 2 3 says, do nothing, Rick, out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, love is never haughty or selfish or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. In other words, it is not all about you. Your preferences, your opinions, your biases, in so many words, the Holy Spirit says to us, get over yourself. Put others first. Put their feelings ahead of your own. And I'll tell you, folks, by way of true confession this morning, that is convicting for me. Here's a third principle for our living. You and I are called to yield our freedoms or our liberty for the benefit of others. Now, a classic principle, uh, a place where you find this principle exposited in Scripture, is, is in 1 Corinthians, both chapters 8 as well as chapter 9. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, talks about our objective when it comes to relating to other believers in, in the body of Christ. Are we moving them towards a deeper relationship with God or away from it? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Holy Spirit then takes up the issue of our objective in terms of the way that we relate to unbelievers, those people who are outside of the church. Now, next week, we'll take a look at chapter nine as we take up the issue of freedom and the lies that we are told today let's just take a look for a moment at at uh, chapter eight and i'd like us to begin there in the first verse again the holy spirit through the apostle paul writes now about food sacrificed to idols we know that we all possess knowledge knowledge puffs up but love builds up the man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. Now, I've taught on this passage a number of times before, and no doubt it's very familiar uh, to most of you, but I'd like us to be reminded of it once again as it pertains to the exercise of our freedom. As you can see, the Apostle Paul takes up, I think, a very interesting and sort of an obtuse historical issue in this text here. If you're not familiar with it, it might not make a lot of sense to you without a little bit of historical and cultural background. Because he starts out by saying, now concerning food that is sacrificed to idols. And before we sort of flesh out the underlying principle here, let me explain if I could just a little bit about this phrase. In the first century AD, when this text was written, if you lived in Corinth, which is a, a port city in Macedonia on the Aegean Sea, you would be living in a Greco-Roman culture. And if there was one thing that was especially true of the Greeks and the Romans, it was that they believed in all kinds of gods. They believed in a pantheon of gods that controlled their environment, their circumstances, and their fortune. The Olympic Games in Corinth were dedicated not to the benefit of uh, you know, international peace and the values of sportsmanship and goodwill among mankind, but rather those games were dedicated to the sea god Poseidon. And in that day, if you were to tour around the city of Corinth, you would see all kinds of multiple sets of temples and statues and fountains and shrines, all of them dedicated to different gods that they believed actively controlled and influenced their world. In fact, there was one temple right downtown that was dedicated to all the gods. It was your one-stop Walmart worship shop right there. You could cover all of your spiritual bases in one spot. There was a huge, a gigantic temple dedicated to Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty and fertility, and in fact, the ruins still remain there today. 
There were temples and statues dedicated to Athena, the goddess of war, or to Tiki, the goddess of good fortune, or to Apollo, the messenger god. And not only were there these temples and these shrines and these statues dedicated to all these gods, but regularly in the life of the city, they would hold citywide festivals and food fests and worship feasts. And as a part of the regular weekly worship of your god or your goddess, as a faithful worshiper there, you would bring a food or a meat offering down to the temple of your choice. You would go down to the local meat market in Corinth, and you would buy not just your $2.99 a pound ground round. You would rather buy the very best meat available, the best cuts that you could afford, the tenderloin, the prime rib, the filet mignon, And you would take that meat then with you to the temple, and there it would be divided into three portions as an offering to your God. One-third of it would be burned up to the God. One-third of it would be given to the priest or the priestesses. And the last third of it would be for you to consume there as a part of your worship. Now, if the priest or the priestesses of Aphrodite or Apollos or Poseidon, or whomever, had had a very particularly good week, and temple attendance had been up, well, then they would have more meat on their hands than they could possibly consume on themselves. And back in that day, of course, they didn't have any large-scale method of keeping that meat frozen and preserved, and so what they would do is, rather than allow that good meat to spoil, what they would do is the temple priests would take that back down to the marketplace and they would then resell it to the vendors where this then choice food could be resold again to the public and it could be purchased by the public at discount prices. And so in the big city of Corinth, you could get the very best cuts of fresh meat at bargain prices. If you did not mind that it had, you know, been in circulation a little bit, and, oh yeah, that it had been, had been dedicated to a false idol. And so, what was going on in the city of Corinth, in the church of Jesus Christ, was that you had some believers who were saying, wow, what a deal this is. And so, they would head down to the marketplace regularly to that special bargain section, and they would buy up the prime rib and the sirloin tips. And they would take that meat back home, and they would eat it, and they would invite their friends over, and they would eat these cuts of meat without really even giving it so much as a second thought. But there were other Christians in that church who, having been saved themselves out of that pagan ritual and worship, people who themselves at one time in their lives bought those same fine cuts of meat and brought them down to the pagan temples to lay there at the feet of Aphrodite, these people could rather not stomach that they could go and buy meat that had been tainted by dedication to a false god and then somehow go ahead and eat that themselves. In other words, there was a problem in the church about whether or not a Christian has the freedom to eat that kind of meat or not. Some mature Christians had no scruples whatsoever about eating it. It's good. It's cheap. It's available. What's the big deal? Why make a fuss about it? While other sincere Christians in the church who had been saved out of that sort of paganism struggled deeply within themselves about that. And so the church wrote Paul a letter, and in that letter they asked him a bunch of questions, and this was one of them. What about eating things sacrificed to idols? You see it there in verses 1 and verse 4. You see, there was some confusion in the church about their objective in the way that they were to live their lives with other believers in the body of Christ. And so what Paul does in this chapter 
is he lays out a very clear principle. And he says simply this, in deciding how you are going to deal with this meat and this food issue, you Christians need to recognize that your freedom to buy that meat and to eat it without giving it a second thought is likely to cause another brother or sister in Christ to stumble. Now, notice how he handles this. First of all, in verses 4 to 7, he says, in deciding whether you should use your freedom in this way or not, it is not simply a matter of what you think that you know. He writes, so then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods but and, and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live, but not everybody knows this. You see, what he's teaching here is that even though you within yourself, may be able to confidently say, look, an idol is absolutely nothing, all right? It's just a, a little hand-carved statue. There's really nothing to that supernaturally. Thus, if food has been offered to something that is nothing, well, then nothing harmful can possibly be associated with eating that food, right? We all know that all these false gods in Corinth are nothing. So why not go ahead and get the cheap food? We know that there's only one God and Father in heaven. We know that there is only one Lord. He's the one that we follow. So what's the problem? We have knowledge. So therefore, we have freedom. Jesus himself said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So I am free to have some steak if I want to. And to that, the Apostle Paul says, hold your fork and knife just a minute. He says, you don't simply decide to use your freedom based on the knowledge that you have. Because he goes on to say in verse 7, not everybody has that same knowledge or conviction. The next thing he writes in verses 7 through 8 is that it is also not simply a matter of whether or not you feel free to do it or not. He writes, some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. In other words, you might argue, well, look, it's just food. And food doesn't get me any closer to God. And food doesn't drive me away from God. I am free to eat food wherever I can find it, any kind of food I want. Now, maybe to contemporize this a little bit, maybe you could insert face mask in place of food if you wanted to. You might be saying to yourself or others, I don't think a face mask does a bit of good in preventing the spread of COVID-19. So I'm not going to wear one no matter what anybody says. I know my science, and I know science says that a mask is useless. I have knowledge about this. Paul says no. That's not the way that you decide this one either. It's not simply about your knowledge, and it's not simply about your right or the freedom to put whatever you want to in your mouth, or for that matter, the right or the freedom not to put whatever you want to on your face. The whole thing is really to be decided not by knowledge or by science per se, but rather, as he shows in verse 9 and following, on what is your objective in relating to your brother or sister? 
What is your objective in relating to other people around you and in the body of Christ? Look what he writes in these next five verses, beginning in verse 9. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? Verse 11. So then this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, Paul says, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. What Paul is arguing is we need to think clearly about our objectives and our example with our brothers and sisters, with with other believers in the body of Christ in terms of the way that we choose to live. Many Christians in Corinth were just saying simply, look, since I'm in Jesus Christ, since I know full well that there is only only one true God, I can live pretty much any way I want to within those parameters. And, And I really don't particularly care whether or not it affects anybody else So get off my back about it, all right? I'm going to have a barbecue. Or I can post whatever I want to on Facebook. Or I can choose not to wear a mask if I don't want to. Or I can choose to give a hug or a handshake to whomever and whenever I want to. And if you don't like it, you can just unfriend me. Or you can sit somewhere else. Or you can just get over it. To which Paul says, wait a minute. Is your main thing, is your objective as a Christ follower in terms of the way that you relate to other people in the body of Christ, is your objective simply to use your freedom or is your objective rather to see your brother or sister experience spiritual growth? The point is, Paul was asking those Christians back then, And he's asking us today to be sensitive to each other in terms of the impact our choices and the exercise of our freedoms have. I think that one of the things that the Apostle Paul would want us as believers to think through carefully today is whether our choices are encouraging on in their walk in Christ, a brother, a sister, in Christ, or does that somehow confuse them? Now, obviously today it may not be food sacrificed to idols. It could be a lot of different things. It could be our use of of alcohol or controlled substances. It could be our choice of participation in music or entertainment. It could be how we interact on Facebook and social media. It could be how we handle the wearing of face masks and and keeping social distancing and practicing safety for the benefit of others. And although we have the freedom to do or not to do a lot of things, we should not um, be asking ourselves the question, is what I do or don't do something that helps Uh, make progress in in my spiritual life, but rather, is it something that sets an example for someone else? For a Christian, when it comes to matters of conscience and matters of preference, the issue isn't really, can I do it or can I not do it? Am I free to do it or am I not free to do it? The deeper issue is, uh, the issue is, will will my doing it or not doing it? wound somebody else's conscience and needlessly offend them and perhaps impede their spiritual growth. What, what Paul is calling for here is for us together in the body of Christ to have the objective of each other's spiritual welfare and growth, to be sensitive to each other, to love and be caring for each other, to live and to walk in a way that we help each other's walk with Jesus Christ. Is there anything in my life that I'm doing right now or that I'm not doing out of, out of the freedom 
that I have in Christ that, in fact, could be causing another person to stumble or to be offended. Be obedient to the law and the dictates of the government. Esteem other people and their feelings higher than your own. Be willing to yield your freedom to benefit others. And here's the fourth and final principle. Be committed to honoring the Lord Jesus Christ in every aspect of your living. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Likewise, Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. And 2 Corinthians 2.15, For we are to God the pleasing fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. When we live for the glory of God and, and to honor Jesus Christ in every area of our living, that is contagious, folks. I'll close with this little video. Hopefully, you'll be able to see it and be able to see it on the screen here. But if not, I'll have it available online on our website later for you to be able to see. Let's take a look. I want to invite you to stand, if you would, this morning as we prepare to be dismissed. The worship team is going to come once again, and they are going to sing us out as we go. I'll pray in just a moment. As you leave this morning from this first worship hour, again, as always, we've got little boxes stationed over here to my right as you go back into the building that way, or if you're exiting this way, there's boxes over there for you to drop in your offerings if you'd like to do that this morning. I'm going to pray, then the worship team is going to sing, and, and you are free to begin to disperse and to leave as they sing you out, all right? Father, thank you for this opportunity this morning to gather together, to be able to worship you in spirit and truth, to be able to do that in the beauty of the creation that you have provided. As we've seen from your words this morning, Lord, these are things that are contrary uh, to the way this world is. The world is not like this. The world is not esteem others more highly than themselves. The world does not always bring itself into subordination and obedience to the government as unto the Lord. The, the world does not choose to yield its freedoms for the benefit of others, and certainly the world does not uh, bring its living into conformity to things that, that honor the Lord Jesus Christ in every aspect of their living. But this is what the kingdom is like, and you've called us to be kingdom people. I pray, Father, as we walk out of here this morning that we'll think about these things and your spirit 
would have freedom to stir them up within our spirit and make a difference in our living and our choosing and in our relating to one another. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. fantastic rest of your week. We're going to sing you out with a live. I was lost with a broken heart. You picked me up and now I'm set apart. From the ash I am born again. Forever safe in the Savior's hands. And you were more than my words can say. I'll follow you, Lord, for all my days. Fix my eyes following your Forever free in unending grace. Yes, you are, you are, you are my freedom. We lift you higher, lift you higher. Your love, your love, your love never ends. Oh, oh, oh. You are alive in us and talking in me. You're the best. You are only You are, you are my freedom, we lift you higher.